Hello, and welcome. Welcome to worship with Caledonia Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Janice, and it really is a privilege and a blessing to have you join us from your safe space, where we continue to gather both in person here in the sanctuary and across time and space. We gather to worship, to praise, to learn, to encourage, to know that we're never alone. We gather because God loves us. God is not mad at you, and God just desires a relationship with you. So I am so very glad that you are here with us. Welcome. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, I invite you to pause, and I invite you to breathe. Take a nice deep breath in, and breathe out. Allow yourself to settle into your safe space. Breathe in and out. Be aware of how you're feeling physically, spiritually, even mentally. And so we're just going to play a little piece of music as we prepare to worship together. So our call to worship, once again, remains based on Psalm 42, where we come together and we say, as the deer pants for the water, the streams of water, our souls long for you, O oh God. Our souls thirst for God, for the living God. Where can we go and meet God? God is with us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Give glory to God, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Let's worship together, shall we? And as we do, I invite you to pray with me. So let's pray together. Welcoming and loving God, you make all things new. You invite people to receive your blessing. Justice and righteousness have their sources in you. We're filled with joy to be counted as your children. Together, join us together, Lord. Make us one in witness and in worship across time and space. Together, we lift our voices to proclaim your all-encompassing love. May our praise join with the praise of all your people and reach the ends of the earth. Lord, you're with us. We thank you. We praise you. And yet, Lord, there are so many ways in which we fail to put you first. So many ways in which we've stumbled, we've fallen, we've neglected our lives with you. We've neglected you. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for all those things we've done, the things we've left undone, things we may have said or things we may have left unsaid. We lay it all at the foot of the cross. It is in the holy name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. My friends, I get to tell you once again that God's not mad at you. It's true. We've all sinned. None of us are perfect. But you know what? It is a greater truth that we're forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek that mercy of God, to all who seek that relationship with God, I say to you, be at peace. Be at peace with yourself. Be at peace with others. Rest in the assurance of God's love and forgiveness. We are forgiven people. Thanks be to God. And so as we turn once again to the 
the holy words of scripture, we turn to the spirits and we pray that our hearts and minds may be opened as we hear these words proclaimed, as we hear these stories, as we hear the living word, may we be transformed in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. And so if you were with us last time, we spent some time in Psalm 85, and we're going to do the same again. Now remember, the psalm reading is attributed to those sons of Korah. It's a prayer for peace. Um, some Jewish commentators propose that it could be a prophetic reading referring to that return from the Babylonian captivity to the people had returned to a ruined city. The temple had been destroyed. They were mourning their land. They were mourning their lives as they were surrounded by powerful enemies. They were surrounded by the darkness of the world around them. And so though we spent time with a few verses last time, we're going to read the psalm in its entirety. And I'd like you to pay attention to some of the action words as we hear and read the word proclaimed. This is Psalm 85, starting at verse 1. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord. Grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the God, the Lord, says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Yeah. And now we're going to turn to the Gospel of Matthew spending some time in chapter 9. Now this chapter describes, you start at the beginning, it describes more than a few of the miracles of Jesus as he traveled the land. You can read about a paralyzed man healed, a girl brought back to life. There's the story of the hemorrhaging woman who had been healed, blind men having their sight restored and more. But we're going to pick up our reading after most of these healing accounts. So this is Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to his harvest fields. This is the living word. Thanks be to God. And so I'd like to return to Psalm 85 as we examine more of it and we continue in this, this theme of revival. Did you catch verse 6 there? The psalmist prays for revival. And today, people across the world, people across our community, even here in our town, 
are praying a similar prayer. And we can discover what God says about revival as well. And, and perhaps you may recall some of the glory days. When you think of revival, you may recall the tent revivals of past generations. Or maybe, maybe you've seen the revival of a person, a life brought to Jesus, touched by God and transformed. We read about lives like these mighty movements, the Spirit of God moving in and amongst the people all throughout Holy Scripture. And it's, perhaps it's time for us to long for the Lord to do it again. And if you were with us last time, we asked, well, what is revival? And in our terms, revival is renewal. It is restoration. It is bringing back to life. It is the fresh inflow of life in the love and the power of God. Perhaps you've heard or you can think about if somebody faints and then when help is brought, they are revived. They wake up. Flowers, flowers droop. But for many, if you place them in fresh water, they will pick back up and revive. And so perhaps it's not far from the truth to think that, that even Christians and, and churches and faith families, maybe they too also droop for a bit and need reviving. And there are also degrees of revival as well. See, a sick person can revive and, and get a little better, stay a little better for a while, and then later be restored to full health and full strength. And the same is true within our faith-based communities. And so as we study on this psalm, may we pray that, that we become deeply burdened for God to send a full-scale Holy Spirit revival to our community, to our land, and indeed throughout the world. So if we're going to pray for revival, well, perhaps there might be some steps that can lead us there. And perhaps the first step might be to recognize, to confess that we need revival. See, our psalmist there confessed the need of revival. Our psalmist felt that need that he prayed there. Will you not revive us again? Think of that need for revival. Think of the need in the world. There are so many people out there without God, without hope. So many people living in stress and darkness and fear and worry. And yes, of course, most of them are outside our faith-based families. And perhaps revival is, is the only key to the tragic situation that is around us. The world needs revival. This thing we call church, the big C church, can be revived and therefore have that, that spiritual power, the vitality. Only in revival can we be lifted up empowered, renewed, refreshed, and strengthened. We do it together in this thing we call church and across the world in this thing we call church, this gathering of people. And revival is also needed in our own personal lives. When we admit, we admit that we're powerless. We admit how frequently we fail. Revival is our our personal need. And it might be safe to say that there won't be any revival until we're willing to admit our need for it. And then once we get to that first step, the need, admitting the need, confessing the need, then we could admit that the possibility of revival is real. Are we convinced that revival is possible? The psalmist was, if you read through the first few verses there, 
The psalmist reminded God what God had done. You showed us this. You restored. The fact that God had sent revival in the past demonstrates the very possibility of revival coming again. Some people don't want to admit the possibility of revival happening in our day. Some people are, are pessimistic. But the possibility is real. History shows us that. And then we rely on those promises of God. The promise of God. God promises to be with us. And as we do that, we recognize the need, we recognize the possibility. We come together to recognize the source of our revival. The source of our revival doesn't start with our movement. The source of our revival isn't going to be something that we do as people. The source of our revival comes from our God. It's not worked up, but God sends it. So therefore, our eyes are on God, not among people, not among churches or denominations, but our eyes are on God. When we look, when we look to God, amazing things happen. When we look to man, we get what man can do. When we look to money, we, we get what money can do. When we look to an organization, we get what that organization can do. When we look to denominations, we get what denominations could do. But when we look to God, we get what God can do. And so what does God promise to do? Well, those are the results of revival. And we can enjoy those results of revival. We read it there again, starting at verses 8 and 9 there. God promises peace to his people. His salvation is near. God's glory will dwell. That's God's presence with us. We're promised that love and faithfulness meet together, that righteousness and peace kiss each other. The Lord, I love this, the Lord will indeed give what is good, and the land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him. See, the results are right there. God's presence, God's love, God's faithfulness, the righteousness, the peace. It's all waiting for us. Those are the results of revival. The harvest is plenty. That's what Jesus said. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. May we pray that the Lord send workers for the harvest. Those workers include you and me, but ultimately the source is God. Now, if you were with us last time, I was throwing out some numbers and crunching some numbers, and I wasn't giving those numbers to make anyone feel guilty about attendance or, or participation. Those numbers were not intended for that by any means. Those numbers were given as an indication. Do you remember how we talked about half of those people, half of the people who professed to be Christians, hadn't gathered together for any type of religious activity, whether it's worship or, or a wedding or a funeral. They hadn't gathered together for the past year for any event. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so we are challenged. May we indeed as a people, as a family of faith, may we be revived. And in doing so, we may just see things that this church, this gathering has never done before in the name of our Lord. Could you imagine that? There is victory in the Lord. And may the Lord bring us revival. Revive our hearts, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Empower us, renew us, refresh us, restore us so that we may dwell in your glory, so that we may encounter that love and faithfulness and righteousness and peace. The harvest is plenty, 
but the workers are few. You think about that. Alleluia and amen. So I invite you to join your heart with mine and let's pray together, shall we? Oh God, it is in you that we place our hope and our trust. We want to praise you with more than just words. We offer you the gifts of ourselves, our resources. May they be used to bring your light and love and your hope and your peace to others. We thank you, God, for welcoming us into your presence once again. And yes, we are so very grateful, but there's so much need for you, Lord. So much need in the world around us. People of all places and times have reached out to you in times of desperation with so many different needs. You have compassion 
for each one. And so we thank you today for the depth of your love. In this time, we set before you our many different hopes and concerns. Fill us with your compassion as we pray from the breadth of the depth of our lives. We pray for all that we are and all that we do, all that we wish we could do and all that we long for. We pray for everything we work for within this faith family, within our community. And we pray for everything we hope for in the face of so much challenge and change. We pray for the troubles that weary us, the situations that puzzle us, and the uncertainty that surrounds us. For those in anxiety, may they find peace. We pray for those in sadness, that they may find comfort. We pray for those in sickness, that they may find healing. For those in loneliness, that they may find company. And Lord, we pray that in our own busyness, may we find space and your presence. In our own listening, may we all find wisdom. And we pray that in our following, that we may find hope. Lord, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. And so we ask you, Lord, to use us as you send out workers into the harvest field. We return to you seeking revival, seeking renewal, seeking restoration. As we pray for a revival here in this community, help us, guide us. It is in the powerful name of Jesus that we come boldly to ask for a fresh outpouring of your spirits. Loving Christ, you are the source of peace and possibility for us all. Help us trust in your grace for today and tomorrow. Fill us in the strength and the hope that we need to walk with you, united in your love, for it is as your followers, it is as your family that we boldly lift our voices in unison as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 And so I thank you again for joining us. As you go forth into the rest of your day, into the rest of your week, into the rest of your world. May you go forth refreshed, renewed, revived. May the peace of God be in your hearts. May the grace of God be in your words. May the love of God be in your hands. May the joy of God be in your soul and in the song that your life sings. As you go, go in peace, go in hope, but above all things, go in love. Amen. <laughs>